Hello and um, good afternoon, everyone. It is um, lovely to be back after a little bit of a break. Didn't see any of you last week, not even James. Um, but we're back again to um, chat. Oh, oh, there he is. Um, to chat about the admissions process. What big hands he has. Gosh, what enormous hands. Um. <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm not even going to, yeah, I don't know what to say in response to that. <laughs> right then. Um, so uh, I suppose to start off with, um, we're going to be talking um, this week about um, various uh, strategies and tips we have for applying to study at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and we'll also be doing a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions that we haven't preemptively answered um, with the slides, please do um, stick around to the end and we will do a Q&A um, to hopefully answer a few of your questions. Um, and next time, uh, so in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about um, how to go about writing a, a really good personal statement. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard that there is talk of the personal statement uh, being retired in a few admission cycles times. Um, the good news is that doesn't affect anyone who is applying this year um, or indeed next year. It's only a problem. Um, really, I think we I think we said it's not until what is it um, October twenty four. It's a problem, right? And that's at the earliest. It may well get pushed back. Yep, that's that's correct. Yeah. So yes, until until the Olympics have have, have gone past. Uh, the next European Championships, um, nothing to worry about in that direction. Um, so the personal statement will still be, be entirely relevant, and we're very much looking forward to seeing what is going to be replacing it, because well, it's exciting. There have been personal statements for 30 odd years now, so I wonder what they've come up with after 30 years of development. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about today is um, the... Uh, sort of this, the the big picture situation we're applying to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, I wanted to kick that off um, by introducing both of us because I've done this in slightly the wrong order. Um, my name is Matt. Um, I look after the research side of things here at Uni Admissions. So all of the ideas that come up in this presentation that you find on our website, um, my job is to make sure that we have good quality evidence behind all of those, uh, make sure they're all true or as close to true as we can manage. Um, and to make sure that, you know, when we are helping you, helping other students, um, that the work we're doing has a, has a real measurable, believable impact. Um, because the last thing you want to be doing is doing things that don't work, particularly if those things take a lot of time. James, who are you? A very good question. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I see some returning uh, names. So nice to see you all again. And welcome to the new uh, people joining us for the first time. Uh, my name's James. Um, I sort of talk with our parents, our students, and I help our students to set a clear strategy and a clear structure for how they're going to tackle their applications um, and, you know, ultimately have the best chance of getting offers out of this. Um, so, yeah, nice to meet you all. Thanks. Um and to sort of mix things up, we're actually starting with the pie chart this week, James. Are you ready? I was born ready for this pie chart. <laughs> so, uh, yes, many of you have seen this before, um, but I think it's, you know, it's really, really useful tool. So when you're applying to Oxford and Cambridge, you know, you've got all of these different things to do. Um, but actually, what is most important, what counts the most, you know, in terms of your application and that's changed over the years. Uh, nowadays, it really does come down to the admissions test and the interviews. Beyond anything else, those really make the biggest difference in your chances of getting an offer. Grades have become a little bit more like a tick box exercise, certainly over COVID. Um, and the pie chart kind of represents how this works. So essentially around sort of 35% of your application is based on your admissions test. Another sort of roughly 35% based on your interview. Around 20% based on your grades. 
And then that final sort of 10% is a combination of everything else. So personal statements, UCAS reference, um, and other less sort of you know, tangible things. Um, so when you're approaching your application, as we'll be talking about today, you know, really the main focus needs to be on your test and interview preparation alongside obviously getting good grades. Um, yeah, I hope that all makes sense. Couldn't have said it better myself, James. Um, James mentioned that um, the changing weight of um, exam grades. Uh, now, as you're probably aware, during the sort of COVID experience, there was um, a system known as teacher assessed grades put in place, which meant that um, for the most part, students did better than we would otherwise have expected them to do. Um, and this made um, life a little bit harder for universities because previously where you would expect roughly 25% um, of A-levels submitted to um, get an A or an A-star, all of a sudden that number was going up to close to 40, sometimes higher than 40%. And that means that if you are looking at the students who applied for your course, previously you knew that they were in the top you know, 10 or 15%, perhaps if they had straight A's, straight A-stars, whereas now with these higher um, these higher rates of um, exam success, it became harder to distinguish between students on the basis of their grades. And this was went for um, A-levels and GCSEs. Now, the um, top grades have started coming back down. Um, so we expect that with any luck, um, things will be more or less back to normal for the cohort of students who are sitting their A-levels in, what, five, six months' time? Um, and so this sort of COVID-related bump um, won't have any particular impact on you, but it's worth understanding that um, it's something the universities have had to take into account because if the if the exams don't provide a reliable way of rank of ranking students as to which are they more and less um, capable, um, the exams end up being less important because they convey less information. That sort of aside, um, let's talk a little bit about Oxbridge specifically. Um, now, the first thing to say here is neither Oxford or Cambridge, there isn't an easy one. They're both difficult to get into. Um, for the most part, um, we will see that there are slightly more applicants to Oxford than there are to Cambridge. And so there's a gap of maybe three or four percentage points between the two. Something like 19% of people get into Oxford if they apply, and something like 23% of people who apply to, um, to Cambridge get in. Now, those are meaningful numbers in the abstract, but that's still only we're talking about a, um, a difference of maybe uh, one in 25, which when, you know, when you're only one person applying, a 1 25th um, change in your chance of getting in between the two isn't, isn't really important. Um, the Oxford interview, Oxford um, tends to interview fewer applicants than Cambridge do. Um, this has been the case for as long as I can remember. Um, and that's about 15 years at this point. Um, so Oxford are more selective when it comes to picking out interviewees. Um, Cambridge are a little bit more, um, tend to interview more people. Um, but in terms of the chance of you getting into either for a given course, there really isn't very much in the way of a difference. Um, most of the additional competitiveness of Oxford is driven by a couple of unbelievably competitive courses. Um, but if you're um, applying for history or law or English or classics or whatever it is, chances are there isn't going to be a huge difference in chances between the two places. There are a few extremely competitive subjects, um, but we're going to look at those in more detail in a minute. Um, so if you've decided you want to go to Oxbridge, which good idea, why not? Um, the first thing you want to start thinking about is the degree that you're going to apply to. Now, there is some but not total overlap between the subjects you might study at school and the subjects that you might study at university. To the best of my understanding, there is no biochemistry A-level, there is no land economy A-level. Um, so some of, the, some of the titles of courses in university are quite different from what you study and some of them even where there is overlap in kind of the name i'm thinking of things like psychology or law 
universities won't put a great deal of weight on whether you study that at A level. Um, they're much more interested in your those subjects. So don't feel as though because you haven't done a law A level, um, you shouldn't be applying for law. As we mentioned, there's a um, fair bit of um, variation as to how competitive each subject is. Um, and the example I use for this is to talk about um, chemistry at Oxford. If you want to study classic chemistry, um, roughly 34% of students get in. Whereas if you want to study biochemistry, it's twice as hard to get in. Um, that extra bio bit is it makes a really big difference, apparently. Um, not being a chemist myself, I would not be able to tell you what the uh, the underlying reason there is. You, you don't happen to know anything about chemistry, do you, James? That is not my specialist subject, Matt. So yeah, I'm not going to be able to offer much there. Um, but yeah, I would say this is a really important point because I, I do have a chat with a lot of parents and you know, I think the differentiation is, do you want to go to Oxbridge or do you want to study a subject because you enjoy the subject? You know, there is no back door into Oxford or Cambridge. Some subjects are, you know, marginally, or in, in some cases, much more difficult to get in. But and there's no point just choosing the most, the most sort of statistically likely subject and then having to go through you know, three years of studying classics, if you've got absolutely zero interest, but really wanted to study law, but just were a bit put off because it's so competitive. I'd really encourage anybody to decide what subject they want to study by doing their research, and then, you know, going for that subject. The only way you can guarantee yourself a chance of getting in is by being one of the top, you know, applicants in your cohort. And, you know, we're talking about today how you can be that, you know, uh, within the top part of your cohort. But yeah, you know, there is no, there's no secret sort of backdoor route in. And I just can't imagine you would enjoy doing something you didn't want to do, you know, just for the privilege of having Oxbridge on your CV. No, absolutely. That's um, that's spot on, James. It's also worth bearing in mind that if you didn't want to really study classics, it would be difficult to fake it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now, we mentioned some of the really competitive subjects. Um, we're thinking here in particular of PPE and E&M at Oxford. Um, that's philosophy, politics and economics and economics and management. Um, the offer rates for these subjects are really low, um, as is the case for computer science at Cambridge. Um, simply put, these are subjects that a lot of people apply, uh, apply to. Um, something something between something fairly close to 2,000 people a year for PPE, a similar sort of number for um, economics and management. Um, there are simply just huge numbers of people applying for these courses, and the number of places does, does not reflect that. Um, so if you are considering these subjects, um, absolutely go for it if that's what you really want to do. But if you are you know, considering um, economics and management at Oxford, but you would be perfectly happy to go for, say, just straight economics at Cambridge, do give that some consideration because you are going to improve your chances because there are, you know, 16, 17, 18 people going after each place for some of these courses. And while we wouldn't suggest making a decision on that basis, um, it's always better to have a 20 or 30% chance than to have a 12% chance. At least, at least that's my view. Um, perhaps if you're more competitively minded than me, um, then you might look at that as a, more of a challenge than a um, than a downside. Oh, I've skipped a slide. Sorry about that. Um, you remember the pie chart from the very beginning of this presentation. I hope it wasn't that long ago. Um, and that is based in part on the um, uh, on this uh, piece of information, which is an extract from the Oxford um, internal guidelines on how to um, assess students who are pl applying for PPE. Um, what I think is worth noting here is the fact that the admissions test is right at the top. The personal statement is right down the bottom. Um, and while your um, GCSEs and your A-level predictions are important. Um, it's the admissions test that above all is the thing that's getting the um, the emphasis. You know, if you get a, a band one, as we see in the second, a little, little um, 
layout, if you're one of the top students in the admissions test, you are almost certainly shortlisted or probably shortlisted. Um, the admissions test can, to a substantial extent, um, be the be, is the main thing that the decision is being made on. Um, now, this might sound a little bit daunting, but I like to look on this as a positive. Um, because of the importance of the admissions test, um, of the interview, even, if, even now, if you're applying to apply in September, um, you still have complete control over your A-level results. You have complete control over your performance in the um, admissions test. You have control over your um, AS results if you're sitting AS levels. Really, the only thing, the only part of your application that's baked in at this point are your GCSEs. So you still have an enormous amount of control over your own chances of getting in. These admissions tests have more weight put on them than your GCSEs. So the situation here is that you have a lot of control, a lot of influence over what's going to happen next. And so if you feel that um, you are you are not Oxbridge material, you haven't done enough yet, you, know, you, you shouldn't feel that way. You still have loads of scope and time to um, improve your chances. And a big part of what we, we do as an organization is to make sure that students understand um, the, the process that they're getting involved in and so that they're focusing their energy on the things that make a difference rather than the things that make less of a difference. Um, now, the first example of this is the personal statement. Now, my experience is that almost everyone puts too much emphasis on the personal statement. Um, I've even worked with students who have been really keen to get personal statements advice for um, universities that have more places than they have applicants. Universities where you're pretty much guaranteed an offer if you apply, and yet they're still worrying about the personal statement. The personal statement is important, but the reference you get from your school is more important than the personal statement. And your performance in the admissions test, again, more important than the personal statement. If you write something really weird or rude uh, in your personal statement, absolutely, it might be disqualifying if you don't write anything at all. Um, but you are not going to, you're not, your fate is not going to be decided on the basis of your personal statement. Um, people do all kinds of interesting, quirky things with personal statements. I've seen a lot of personal statements that are poems. Um, I've seen personal statements with acrostics in them, all sorts of strange things. Um, you can make it a an opportunity to show off your creativity, but it is not. It's not going to be the decisive factor. So I would say, don't put all of your your time and energy into the into the personal statement, fun as it might be. I'm not sure people find personal statements fun. Um, really, a good personal statement is fairly straightforward. You need to have a clear enthusiasm for the subject that you want to study. And you want to be able to show that enthusiasm through the things you have done, not simply say that I could say I am incredibly passionate about um, marine biology. And I could say that, uh, but actually, there's no evidence I am. I haven't read any books about marine biology. I haven't done any marine biology. I don't even really like sailing. I think fish are gross. <laughs> it, wouldn't make, it, it, it wouldn't make for a very good personal statement. You need to, you know, give an honest account of yourself, tell them what you care about, really, really show how deep and interesting your passion is, and that you are going into that subject area that you are reading, not just the, the first books that pop up for the subject when you type it in on Google, but that you're going deeper, that you're exploring ideas, that you have an interesting, engaging personality, um, that the person who's reading it might want to meet um, and to do it in clear, efficient, effective writing, not in the fanciest, floweriest writing you can manage. It doesn't need to rhyme. It doesn't need to be a poem. It doesn't need to have an, an elaborate acrostic. You will be perfectly successful in your personal statement by having a, a clean, clear piece of writing that shows how passionate you are. You don't need to write a sonnet. And people, oh, people love writing a sonnet for their personal statement. I've seen like eight or nine of them. Yeah. Yeah, not not advisable. No, I mean it's it's cute, but 
you know, it's, it's not a it's not a poetry contest. Um, maybe that maybe that maybe that will change though. Maybe as of uh, spring twenty of uh, autumn twenty four, it will be a poetry contest. You have to write a really good poem to get in. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? I, I think the odds on that one might be slightly low, but yeah, never know. I, I think it. I I wouldn't be surprised. You know, in in a number of years, if it moved into some I'll sort have to of work on that for next week. In some sort of some video, sort of... you know, um, presentation, but we'll see. Ooh. Oh, a, a personal statement TikTok. Now that's that's what I want. It could happen. Um, maybe maybe I'll do maybe I'll do a personal statement poem for next week. That might be fun. Um, the next thing to think about is extracurricular activities, and this is a little there's a little bit of nuance here so i'm going to try a little bit of obscure james um so if you're applying to university in the united states um they'll be very interested in whether you are an olympic gymnast or a really talented golfer or whether you are one of the best um polo players in maryland these things are all interesting to u.s universities they are not interesting to british universities they will not care. Um, you could be um, you could be in the Olympics, but if you were in the Olympics and you did badly in your uh, GCSEs and your A levels, that wouldn't help. And that's because at Oxford and Cambridge, they don't you can't do a degree in diving or in um, what else do they do in the Olympics? Shot put. Yeah, you can't do a degree in shot put. It isn't it isn't on the menu. So you demonstrating that you're really good at that thing, while it's nice, is not relevant to your application. It is only about how good at the kind of academic work you would be doing at university you are. Now, if you have done a bunch of interesting extracurricular activities, um, school plays, school orchestra, debating clubs, volunteer work, any of these things, they can be useful, but they have to be useful because they are evidence of your passion for the subject, not because they are evidence that you've done the thing. If you are really interested in um, studying, studying English, then you could use the work you've done in the context of school plays to demonstrate your enthusiasm for studying English, but you can't say that because you're so good at acting, you should be allowed in. It's got to be an indicator of academic ability, not a substitute for it. I think that's so important, actually, because, again, you know, talking to lots of students and parents every year, I do feel like, you know, I don't know, I'm not blaming schools here at all, but I think schools lead with personal statement. They lead with sort of extracurriculars as like the go to. You need to do all of these things. But actually, the reality is it's not what you've done. It's your ability to discuss and articulate yourself on what you've done in, you know, in reference to your desire to study the subject. You know, if you present Oxford with a list of 30 things that you've done, it's absolutely meaningless unless you actually can, you know, verbally communicate why those things are important and how they've helped you develop an interest in your subject. So when you're doing things like reading, if you're doing extracurricular activities you've really got to practice the skill of actually discussing and reflecting on what you've done so i think that's another really important point don't just sort of do things because you think on paper it looks good that's not really the point um, as matt says it's about your ability to to demonstrate your interest in the subject by being able to discuss and reflect on those things not simply you know writing that you've done it if that makes Absolutely. sense. You will meet any number of students applying for medicine who have, let's say, grade eight piano. Uh, but what you will not find is any pianos uh, in hospitals. Um, it's not an important part of medicine. It's good. I think it's good for people to be pianists. But you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing that at the expense of something more directly relevant. And I should hope that you're learning the piano because you like the piano. If you're learning the piano because you want to become a doctor, it's a very elaborate route to it. I'd say there's probably easier ways of becoming a doctor than by being a pianist. It's a very, it's a very strange way to get to the destination. Um, 
Now, after the personal statement, um, after you've carefully taken out all of the sentences about your extracurricular activities, um, you'll be faced with the admissions test. Um, almost every subject at Oxford and Cambridge has an admissions test. There are a couple of exceptions, um, but at least 90%, possibly more of the subjects have a test. Um, for Oxford, most of these are sat about two weeks after the UCAS deadline. Um, for Cambridge, some of them are sat then, and some of them are sat when you're visiting Cambridge for your interview. It varies between a subject. It can vary a tiny bit between colleges. Um, so this is something you want to make sure that you are keeping an eye on and that you're up to date with um, before you apply so that you know what you're being expected to do. And most of all, what you're expected to know um, for one of these tests. Because what we find um, is that there is an extraordinarily strong correlation between test performance and success in the process, in the admissions process. Uh, so I'm looking here at the example of the MAT, uh, the score, the test that's used at Oxford for students applying to study maths. And I mean, this may seem obvious, but one of the ways that they decide who is good at maths is they get them to do a maths test. Uh, the maths test is very hard. Um, it goes beyond uh, what is studied at A-level. And so it serves as a good way of testing who is really good at maths. And what you'll see is that the students who do really well on this test um, are those who get um, offers and get um, interviews. And students who score poorly on the test, very occasionally they'll get an interview, very occasionally they'll get a place. But that there is an extraordinarily strong correlation here. You can see the kind of three nested bell curves um, of how the... Uh, the test influences your chances of getting in. Um, and this goes for pretty much every subject. Um, you might think this wasn't the case with English, but the um, the shape of the graph and the correlation are just as strong for English as they are for maths. Um, and so, as we mentioned there, knowing what you're being tested on, it's a difficult test, but one way to make it easier is to make sure that you know what the syllabus is that you've been practicing in the run-up because you can bet the good chunk of those people, the 100 or so people who are scoring 30% um, uh, uh, or below, a lot of those people will simply not have prepared. They will have not, they will have been questions on this test that they've simply never seen before. New mathematical ideas. It is entirely within your power to find out what is on the test. And if you want to get in, that's really where you want to start focusing your energy. Um, what we found is that, and this kind of goes as an average across all of the tests, moving from the 59th percentile to the 66th percentile, the, yeah, sorry, um, of test performance can double your chance of being invited to interview. Um, if we look back um, at, uh, at this slide here, what you can see is that students who are um, in the 60s, we're seeing, um, well, whatever that column column height of uh, interview offers is, and the, as they get up higher into the into the, the um, low sixties, and even then into the high sixties, the share of students in getting being invited to interview doubles, and then almost doubles again between those um, eight or ten marks. You don't want to find yourself in the situation that you missed out on those eight or ten marks because you simply hadn't looked at that particular subfield of calculus because you didn't know it was on the test. That's why it's so important to prepare. Um, the other thing to say is this is not so much the case now, um, but in years past when students weren't sitting formal A-levels, the admissions tests were the only thing that every um, applicant had in common. That's still the case um, to a slightly lesser extent. Some students will be doing a AQA, some students will be doing edXL, some students will be applying with Iris Leaving Cert, some with Scottish Hires. Even in non-COVID times, the admissions test is the only piece of work that every student applying to study the subject has done. And so it is the only completely fair comparison that the universities can use to make decisions. Everything else, everyone's had different experiences, different tests, different schooling backgrounds. The test is the only thing that they've all done at the same time on the same day with the same questions. That's why sort of in summary, I would say an extra hour on the test, even if all you're doing is subtly improving your multiple choice technique, is going to make a much bigger difference to your um, application than shuffling the commas around in your personal statement. Fun as shuffling the commas around is, 
you can take out a very, put in a quite, you can waste a lot of time editing your personal statement. Um, but I would, I would urge everyone to put that time into preparing for the admissions test instead. Um, now that brings to the end my, my little bit of the slides. Um, so now it's James's turn to have slides. Are you ready, James? Very ready, yeah. Let's go. Here we go. All right. So um, as many of you know, we are a preparation school. That's what we do. So we support students every year who are applying for Oxford and Cambridge. So all of these things we've been talking about today, the, all of that sort of information is incorporated into you know, how we support students. So um, we are selective. That's the first thing I should say. So we don't work with every student. But what we do like to do is to kind of have a chat with you um, and then find out a little bit more about your application, your plans, and then potentially recommend a program sort of based on that. Um, so in terms of a program, well, it kind of consists of four main things. It does vary slightly depending on you, know, you and your specific context. But generally speaking, there are four parts to a program, um, first of which is uh, that was a very nice slide change there. Um, the first of which is one-to-one -one tuition. So, you know, it's really important to actually get input to improve. I think that's what happens to a lot of students. They try and do, you know, prepare on their own. They sort of reach a bit of a plateau and they can't break through. And that plateau could be those eight marks, you know, that makes a difference in your chances. So working with a tutor who's sort of been through the process before, I think is really, really important. So we match you to a tutor and they work with you to prepare for the test, interviews, et cetera. Um, alongside working with your tutor, you, you also work with our materials and resources. So, I mean, we've been doing this a long time. We've um, sort of published, I think almost a hundred books now actually for the Oxbridge and medicine application. So I don't know if you have an exact number Matt's on top of your I, head. I, I think we're over a hundred, but it's one of those things that turns out to be tricky to count. Yeah. Um, I might, I might ask Rowan if we can come up with an official number. It would be nice. Um, but it was, it was eighty-five as as long ago as twenty twenty. So I should imagine we've brought in a couple more. Yeah, I think so. I think it, I think we were hovering around or just above a hundred. But anyway, the idea is, you know, we've written these books, we've created a lot of bespoke resources in preparation for these applications and we have an online portal which is sort of the hub of the program i think what's really key though is it's a structured curriculum that you work through you know it's really important to have structure and understand what to do and when to do it when you're preparing for this sort of thing so within our student portal and within our program you're following quite a sort of uh, structured um, syllabus as it were um, alongside those things our students uh, tend to also join us for our enrichment sessions. Um, these are sort of weekend sessions where we're, as it says, sort of diving into um, topics within your subject. So if you're applying for law, you know, we'll be looking at the um, you know, international law. We might be looking at the Human Rights Act or whatever it may be. And the idea is to kind of broaden your understanding a little bit, but actually just as I was saying earlier with your reading, it's not what you've read that matters so much as your ability to discuss it in the same way that you'll be expected to do in your interview. So our enrichment sessions are all about building your ability, your skill, your confidence in having those kinds of conversations and practicing for the interview. Um, so those are our enrichment sessions. And then finally, our courses tend to be Kind of punctuated with these intensive kind of day courses for you know tests and interviews and it's that kind of consol consolidatory oh that's a, a good word consolidatory piece you know to bring everything together and give you a sort of final springboard into the different stages of your application so that's kind of what a program looks like i think the key things for anybody who is applying to oxford or cambridge you know it's to decide what subject you want to study, then really think about how you're going to manage that over a year. Statistically speaking, the earlier you start preparing, the better you do. Um, and that only goes, you know, that goes alongside actually preparing efficiently as well. 
Um, and that's the idea of a program, really. It's not a sort of hand-holding process. It's just to give you structure and input to make the improvements you need to ultimately get into Oxford or Cambridge. Um, and I think that might be the end of my slides. I don't let him have many slides. I'm very greedy. Um, the good news is all of this seems to work. Um, we have really, really enviable success rates that we're really proud of. Um, we're hoping to, in the next um, little while, get our 500th offer for um, Oxford and Cambridge. It's very close. Um, I think we're in something in the 490s at this point, so it's just a case of um, the news we get from our um, students who've applied um, this past cycle who are hearing back in the next the next few weeks and days. Um, and those numbers compare really favourably with even the fancier schools. Um, if you um, have enjoyed this webinar, please do um, leave us a lovely review on Trustpilot. Um, as I mention every week, without success, um, if you write a lovely review mentioning how much you enjoyed this webinar, how handsome I am, how much more handsome James is, um, I will put it in every single one of these webinars going forward. Um, you will get to be a, a star of the webinar and be seen by, believe it or not, thousands of people a year. We also have a podcast which is um, features our founder Rohan and my colleague Will. Uh, they discuss everything from admissions tests through to the zombie apocalypse. Um, and they have finally invited me to be on, so I can at last be nice about it. Uh, previously, I was very strongly opposed to the podcast through sheer petty jealousy. Um, so what we'll do now is we will take on some questions for a little while. Um, so to start off with, um, all you need to do for these is there's a QA and a box Pop your question in. We will do our best to answer it before we run out of time. Um, and if you would like to speak directly to James or to one of his colleagues, um, all you need to do is follow the perhaps a touch patronizing um, instructions that are appearing on the uh, screen now, hopefully through the video, showing you how to book a consultation with us. Um, so uh, our first question is from uh, Devanch. Uh, they ask, um, how important are GCSE grades for applying to Oxbridge? Um, so I think the thing to say here is that, that GC, good GCSEs are, I would say, fairly necessary, but not sufficient at all. Um, if you've done well in your GCSEs, if you've got a mix of eight and nines or a couple of sevens, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, we have data on um, average GCSE scores for students applying to Oxbridge. And those scores are generally something in the range of um, what used to be an A minus. So something like a 7.6, lower end of an eight. Um, your GCSE scores are, they're important to this extent that they are indicative. But what we also find is there are plenty of students who will sort of kick off their academic potential after GCSE, really get going in, as they find themselves only studying a smaller number of subjects um, in sixth form. And in those instances, um, we encourage students not to worry too much about their GCSEs, because if they can show the progression, you know, an extra 18 months of um, intellectual development makes a really big difference at 17 or 18. And so if your GCSEs are a little disappointing, I wouldn't worry about it. And if your GCSEs are brilliant, well, well done. You've got brilliant GCSEs. Um, a couple of other um, Questions. Uh, so, um, Shubanji, I hope I pronounced that right, um, asks about how, where the statistics we use come from. Um, so, those come directly from uh, the universities themselves. And my understanding is that those are the number of applicants is the number of students who submit to um, study the course through UCAS. So, that number is fixed on the 15th of October each year. And the number of people who get in is the number of um, offers that are sent out. Um, the number of offers is always slightly larger than the number of places um, because the universities expect a few people to fall short of their offers. But aside from that, it's um, it's fairly straightforward. We don't, um, I'd say we do have um, more detailed information on how, how many students pass through each stage. So if that's something you'd be interested in, um, give us a call and we will hopefully be able to share a little bit of that with you. Um, but as ever, it's difficult for me to get to the spreadsheet um, while I'm doing the webinar. 
Um, Tilly asks about um, a fourth A level. Where are you on um, fourth A levels, uh, James? Yeah, I, th I think it's quite a common, you know, question, um, or people are a little bit unsure about whether a fourth A level really makes a difference. Um, I think it's firstly, I'd say if if you have one student, as an example, so first student who has three A stars and you have a second student who's doing four A-levels and gets three A-stars and a B, the first student is the better, quote-unquote, student in the eyes of the universities because they've got 100% A-stars. So it's all about, from my perspective, it's all about managing your time. You've got a finite amount of time in your application. You've got to manage your A-levels. You've got to treat your application almost like an A-level itself in terms of the amount of time you commit to it. So are you going to do four A-levels at school and then also be preparing, you know, two, three, four hours a week for your Oxbridge application? For some people, that might be doable. I think for some people, the risk is one of your A-levels is going to fall short slightly in terms of your grade. And then actually you're going to weaken your application. So generally speaking, you only need to do three A levels, concentrate on those and get three A stars or the best possible grades you can. There are some um, differences, I guess, if you're applying to some of the STEM subjects where you've got to do further maths, you know, it changes things slightly, but um, largely speaking, you really only need to do three A levels. Um, would you agree, Matt? Yes, um, I would say there are there are two added bits of detail I would I would put on there. Um, if you're doing further maths as a fourth A level, I think that's generally speaking a good idea. Um, if you're planning to study a a mathematics um, sort of oriented subject like maths or physics or economics, um, the other is if you are doing the fourth A level in your native language. Um, we had a student a couple of years ago who was doing a fourth A level in Japanese. It turns that they were Japanese, uh, for them the A-level was very easy, they did not revise. Um, if that's your situation, if you speak fluent Spanish and you want to do a Spanish A-level, um, then you can, but at the same time I wouldn't say there's an extraordinary amount of point. If you already know how to speak Spanish, you probably don't need a certificate um, that says so unless you really want one, but for the most part I would say stick to three unless you're really going to be doing further maths or you kind of want to do an extra one for fun. Um, it's, it's just too high risk. And you should always remember when it comes to these extra subjects, you will have plenty of time after your A-levels to study them. Um, doing it at school, doing it for a certificate isn't the be all end or if it's something you want to do um, sort of in addition as a sort of a, a fun extra. Um, Let's have a look. Um, we have a few questions about, um, oh, we've got a lot of questions today. Gosh. Mm. <laughs> um, what a, what a, wow. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a really good week for people to um, get in touch directly because these are some really good questions. I'm not going to be able to answer some of them because I actually have to do some research first. Um, uh, so we have a question about um, advice for students taking gap years. Um, now, there is a, a little bit of a disadvantage, generally speaking, for gap years if you're studying a STEM subject. Um, the reason for this is that people tend to forget how to do maths. Um, it's as simple as that. It's not because um, it's in some sense worse or better. Um, it's simply that students have a Is apart from making sure that you're up to speed with your maths if you need to be, is making sure that you are doing something that you can put into your personal statement that you can use as evidence of your enthusiasm for this. Oh dear, Matt, your uh, sort of uh, connection is dropping a little bit. I think it's probably going to pop back up in a second. I think what Matt's saying there really is that you're not uh, sort of discriminated against for taking a gap year, but in the case of, you know, a STEM subject like maths, just because you're not actually studying maths at school anymore, you, you might sort of lose your, um, 
what's the word? What am I thinking of? Like, you just might not be quite as good as you were because you're not engaging with it as much. Um, that's really the only um, downside. Um, and there's another question here about kind of reapplying for law. Um, we did a, we actually did an open day last week uh, specifically on the subject of, of reapplying. Um, so um, do let us know, we can send that to you because there's a lot of really inf interesting information. But generally speaking, as we saw last week, statistically, reapplicants do or tend to do as well, if not slightly better than first time applicants. Um, so yeah, definitely don't be put off by reapplying. I think for our reapplicants, again, it's about, you know, making a decision to reapply or not reapply. Because when you first get the information that you've been rejected, it's quite a raw, it's, you know, it's not a nice position to be in. So take some time, make a decision. Are you going to reapply? And then put your efforts into reapplying. Um, you, you'll stand the same, if not a slightly better chance of, of getting in if you put in the, the correct work. So um, I'd always encourage people to reapply if they're doing it for the, the right reasons. I think Matt has come back. We've got, I'm currently seeing a still of Matt's face. Um, this could be a submission to our reviews. Um, okay, let's have a look at some of the other questions. Um, somebody's asking, is Duke of Edinburgh necessary? So again, that's sort of a typical question that we get asked because you know a lot of students will do Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, they'll do you know Model United Nations. They'll do these sorts of things, which are good fun. I definitely encourage you to do it if you have time because you know they're they're great sort of growth um, experiences personally. Um, but actually, in terms of your chances of getting an offer, they don't make any statistical difference at all. Oxford and Cambridge, as Matt said, they're really academically ruthless. They don't care about Duke and Edinburgh. They don't care about what grade you are in your musical instrument. You know, they're not interested in your sort of drama experiences. They're interested in, you know, your grades, your admissions test score, and things that you are doing or have done in preparation for, you know, learning your subject at university. So if you've got time, you want to do Duke of Edinburgh, fantastic. If it's a choice between Duke of Edinburgh or preparing for your admissions test, you know, I hope by now the answer is, is very clear. You know, spend your time where it's actually going to count. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, somebody's asking about EPQs. So I know some schools, uh, you know, plenty of the independent schools kind of require students to do an EPQ and in many other schools it's encouraged. Again, you know, if you've got time, then definitely do an EPQ. Again, just like before, it really depends on what you can fit into the finite amount of time that you have. If you can do three A-levels and EPQ, you know, your other interest in your life, tennis, football or whatever it is, and then also prepare for your application, fantastic. But if it's a choice between all of those things, it should just be three A-levels and you know preparing for your application itself. If you are doing an EPQ, definitely is a good idea to do it related to the subject that you're interested in, because as part of that EPQ, you're going to be doing research. So that's good. That's something that you can kind of discuss and potentially reflect on in your interview. Um, and again, it's showing that you're engaging and you've got a genuine interest in this subject. So yes, I would um, try and make your EPQ related to your subject of interest. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, the IB and sort of higher levels. Um, so it, it depends on the subject because every subject at Oxford and Cambridge have, have specific uh, grade entry requirements. Um, so it, you know, it could be 776. It, you know, really could be, um, it could be anything really depending on the subject. Specifically for law, I don't know off the top of my head. I am going to hazard a guess that it's 766 
I may be wrong, have a look at the Oxford or Cambridge website and it will tell you very clearly that's the minimum. And actually, that's a good point. You know, the grade requirements, they are minimums. So if your subject says three A's, just bear in mind that that kind of gets you into the category of being a credible applicant. But many students will be applying with three A stars. Um, somebody has asked a um, very interesting question about um, studying in a private school versus a state school. Um, so this is a kind of an ongoing sort of uh, evolving situation at the moment. Previously, Oxford and Cambridge were quite uh, open about the fact that they are trying to positively discriminate. They're trying to recruit more state school students. And as a result, we have seen a significant decline in the number of students uh, being accepted from independent schools. Um, however, uh, I saw something very recently, and it's something that Matt will be kind of looking into in more detail as part of the research team. But I think more recently, they've actually slightly changed that approach a little bit. And, you know, they're not going to so actively, you know, they wouldn't call it discriminate, but it kind of is against independent school students. But of course, if you go to an independent school, school the issue is that you, all of your peers are more likely to be doing very, very, very well academically, because that's just the nature of many independent schools. You know, the vast majority of students will be getting three A stars, whereas at a state school, perhaps it depends on the school, but perhaps in general, f fewer students will get, you know, that sort of three A star um, grade profile. So I think the expectations are slightly different. Uh, but again, yeah, when you're going back to the pie chart, what really makes the biggest difference is the admissions test and the interview. So it doesn't matter where you go to school, doesn't matter what your background is. If you're one of the top performers in your test and you have a really, really strong interview performance, you, you're in with a really, really strong chance of getting an offer. And yeah, I think that's really important to note. Uh, let's have a look. So some, some of these questions are kind of really specific to the individual, which is fantastic. But, you know, perhaps for the, um, you know, we've only got a few minutes left. I'd, I'd say get in contact with us, go on the website, you can fill in a little inquiry. And then, you know, one of the team will be in contact with you and they can discuss your individual case. You know, if it's a specific set of criteria and a context, I don't think we re really can sort of go through it now. Wouldn't be the best use of time, I would say. Um, somebody's asking about IELTS. Yes, there is an IELTS um, requirement to study at Oxford and Cambridge. It, it depends on the subject again. Um, off the top of my head, generally speaking, I think it's around sort of seven point five in the IELTS that you need to have to study at Oxford or Cambridge particularly if it's a humanities subject. I think the requirement is slightly lower if it's a STEM subject. Um, so again, you can find that information out by looking on the Oxford Cambridge website or by having a chat with us and we can look into it you know, specifically for you. Off the top of my head, it's 7.5. Um, okay. I think, I, I think we've worked through the majority of questions there. Um, apologies if you did type a question and I haven't answered it. Obviously, we've had a bit, bit of a tech problem there. Um, so I think we'll call it a day. Um, do get in contact. If you've got a specific question, you know, uh, get in contact with us. We'll answer it for you. Um, you know, very happy to chat with you and find out a little bit more about you and your context and help make a recommendation for you. Um, so do get in contact. Um, I believe we're back in a fortnight, but um, keep an eye out on the website because I may be wrong, maybe next week, uh, but I think it's in two weeks time. Um, lovely to um, have kind of had the opportunity to chat with you all and I hope this was useful and yeah, look forward to seeing you all next time. So have a lovely rest of your weekend.